you know, it's interesting you say it would be a paradigm shift, but you know, we, we say the same thing about type two diabetes. Type two diabetes is a chronic irreversible condition that will gra gradually get worse over time. We know that's not true anymore. So let's look at heart disease reversal next. Welcome to the Fat Emperor podcast. I'm your host, Ivor Cummins. We're supported by the Irish Heart Disease Awareness Charity, which advocates a simple CT scan to reveal your CAC score. So know your score and take action to prevent that premature heart attack. Everything you need to know will be right here. I'm here in the Royal College of General Practitioners at the PHC UK conference, and I got to catch up again with Dr. Asim Mulhatra. Great to see you there. Always good to see you, mate. Absolutely. And you were in Australia recently and you messaged me about a doctor over there who's doing a lot of calcium scanning and some really interesting stuff you were learning from him. Yeah, absolutely. So I was on a speaking tour of Australia um, and my topic was really about too much medicine and statins, etc. Uh, one of my, somebody I've become very friendly with who I met uh, last time I went to Australia is a, a cardiologist called Dr. Ross Walker. Um, he's been a cardiologist for, for many years. Uh, at least three decades, a very experienced cardiologist and uh, very well known, very well respected. And he uses calcium scores a lot. In fact, he has uh, treated uh, and utilized calcium scores in tens of thousands of patients. So he's probably, as far as I know, um, uh, the, certainly the person I know more than anybody else as a clinical cardiologist has used them. And I think that's really uh, interesting and useful to see what his what experience, uh, what impact that's had on his knowledge and how that he can, you know, he what he shared with me. Um, I'm uh, fully behind, uh, like with anything in medicine, of course, it's about using the right test in the right patient. But certainly when it comes to assessing cardiovascular risk, um, and, and you, this is the best tool we've got. It's the best tool, it usurps anything. It usurps Q risk calculators. It tells you whether you've got disease, as you know, uh, uh, Ivor, and it also tells you about the, uh, the 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 risk, and also what we can do serially. And I, uh, you know, I've started using it in some of my patients is to see about rate of progression of disease as well and risk. And I think that um, that is definitely a, a, a useful, uh, a potentially very useful role for patients. Um, w for me personally, one thing I found uh, I, I found very interesting about calcium scores is the use of calcium scores in patients who may be deemed a particular high risk from a curious score or have high cholesterol and are not particularly keen on going cholesterol and drugs or statins for example um, so i'll just give you one example and this has been repeated a few times is i've seen a number of patients with familial hyperlipidemia who first diagnosed in their late 50s and uh, as you know familial hyperlipidemia is a genetic condition which has a very strong association with the development of premature heart disease um, but that doesn't mean everybody with FH is going to get heart disease. And um, uh, these patients, uh, you know, ladies in their late 50s come to see me. First diagnosis of cholesterols, you know, we're talking about total cholesterol of 20, LDLs of over 10, 15. I mean, very high LDL cholesterol, but otherwise extremely fit. Normal blood pressure, um, no ins markers of insulin resistance, normal glucose, slim, active. And they have come to see me because they've been told that unless they go on a statin or a cholesterol drug, in, in quotes, uh, one of the doctors told them they wouldn't be around for much longer, almost giving them a kind of uh, death sentence, like terminal cancer. Um, of course, you and I know that's not a very ethical or, or, or kind of scientific way of having a discussion with patients uh, necessarily. Um, but one thing that's been very useful in each of these patients is use of calcium score and sometimes even a CT coronary angiogram. All of them have come back as zero. So clearly, logically... Um, if cholesterol was a risk factor for them, for them personally, they would have at least some, if not extensive coronary disease by their late 50s. And the fact they've got nothing is clear indication it's not a problem for them and therefore they can be reassured they do not need to lower their cholesterol. Yeah, no, that is another excellent use for the scan. And actually, I'm getting a lot of people coming out of the woodwork now. I have a gentleman of 62 with a uh, LDL of, I think, around 340 American units, up near nine, a total cholesterol of 12 or, you know, 500 for the American us units. And he got a scan and he got a zero score. And also a family of familial hypercholesterolemics who have been on drugs, but they are in their 60s, and two at least of three siblings have zero score, zero heart disease registered. Now, they are on, on lipid-lowering drugs, 
But the reality is they still got enormous cholesterol. So it just shows that cholesterol is very much an association that may indicate a problem or it may not be a problem. And you need to look deeper to find out which it is. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. And I think, uh, I think this is about the evolution of the science so we can identify the right patients for the right treatment. Unfortunately, our healthcare system is being run by uh, more profit-making industries and how doctors make decisions rather than actual good science, you know, and treating individual patients. So I think the calcium score is a, is a very useful tool for that. I think the other thing as well, I know, Ivor, you've, you've looked at this in a lot of depth and, uh, you know, we've shared information on all of this and obviously I see the patients and it, it's very useful to have um, various bits of information that can inform patients. But one of the things that's interesting as well is how um, the progression of calcium score to the, and serial calcium scores can also predict risk of events. And I think you, you told me that, you know, that if it's more than 15% in three years, then it's a much, the, 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 the increased risk of events is much, much higher than if it's less than 15% in terms of increase of calcium score. Yeah, the serial calcification, I mean, there's no some noise in the data, but the RAGI study I showed you was, was really good. And it was 17 times more likely to have a heart attack if you were progressing rapidly rather than slowly. Uh, very fair study. In fact, it was 50% event rate modeled for people who are progressing rapidly and 3% for the same high scores at the start, but not progressing. But I think the best I can say about that is Professor Budoff, who's the world's leader in imaging, in general, he has a huge paper covering progression. And generally, regardless of the starting score, fast progression is six to eight times more risky, even for people who have the same starting score. So serial is powerful. And I think Dr. Walker w was discussing that with you as well. Over yeah, and I yeah. think this is, again, an area which I don't have a lot of expertise in specifically. But one thing that he pointed out to me, which was interesting as well, uh, as, as I know, as many people know and cardiologists know, is that um, it's, you know, it's, it's plaque rupture that's the problem when it comes to cardiovascular events in terms of heart attacks. Uh, and cardiovascular mortality. Of course, if you've got significant stenosis over time, it may well give you symptoms, okay? But the real issue in terms of, of death and heart attacks is plaque rupture. And that often happens in plaques that are non-significant and may not be particularly calcified. You know, it's the softer plaques that are prone to rupture. So one of the interesting things that Ross also highlighted to me as well is that even if you get uh, increase in calcium score, if the overall plaque volume reduces, that's a result because actually, hypo, you know, hypothetically speaking, certainly, a more calcified plaque is also a more stable one. And I've seen that when I've been doing angioplasties when I was in the cath lab and we'd see people that, you know, the, 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 the plaques are the most difficult or most, most challenging to stent, you know, to stick a metal coil to stretch the artery to improve the, the lumen diameter, improve blood flow, are the ones that are the most calcified. So actually, the, the, the paradox a little bit is that calcified plaques are probably less likely to rupture. But I think more calcium also indicates more soft plaque. That's precisely it. And I still, years, many years later, still get this argument about soft plaque. Because, but the people simply don't understand it. So more calci calcium means proportionately more soft plaque under exactly. the surface. So that's why it's a very accurate measure of risk. Just because it's softer plaque or the uh, the kind of join or interface between calcified plaque and soft plaque is often a weak point. Just because that's where the rupture happens doesn't take away in any way from the fact that higher calcium means higher calcified plaque and higher soft plaque proportionately. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. Exactly. And we actually, oh, you're aware we did with Donal O'Neill of Serial Killers. We did a documentary. Who's, Don who's Donal? Oh, Donald. <laughs> Donald. Who's that? He's, he's, he's kind of a, he's a nice guy. He's a funny guy. You, you'd like him. But uh, he, we did a documentary, which we already released for free, and I'll link it again on this podcast, a half-hour documentary with Irish sporting heroes who were the top heroes in 1991 in Ireland. And we scanned 45 men in their 50s, most of them slim, in great shape for men in their 50s. Very impressive, big men. And we scanned them all. And all of them were deemed to be healthy by their doctors and all their blood markers looked fine. There was nothing suspected. And 20% of them had from 150 up to 3,200 scores. So had to immediate follow up with uh, doctors and uh, cardiologists in some cases. So it just showed there's 20% of super high risk guys in there in a group of 40 something who were all deemed as low risk. So when people drop dead of a heart attack in their 50s and they're slim and fit, like some of our guys with huge scores are slim and fit, and then people say, oh, 
you know, it's kind of like a bolt from the blue or, you know, uh, it's funny, he didn't smoke, he was slim, but there's a trend as yeah. well that when you measure their blood glucose after a meal, our guys with the big problem, it's jumping up really high. It's a really good point. I think that mm. highlights that weight and activity, so being a so-called normal some sim- weight and being active, should not give people the illusion of protection. Having said that, um, I think there needs to be a more specific research about whether these are a separate group. So are athletes with high calcium scores, you know, are they at the same risk as somebody who's a non-athlete with a similar calcium score? and other risk factors. And my guess is they're probably not at the same risk, but certainly there is more risk than being completely zero. You want your calcium score to be zero. You don't want anything in your coronary arteries. So I think there's probably a, a more of a nuance there, but certainly it's, 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 um, it goes against what most people probably believe. They think that if you're a footballer and you're middle-aged and you're slim and you're active, that the chances of, of heart attacks is extremely small or there's almost no chance of having coronary disease. But clearly, um, and I think the data that's there suggests that isn't the case either, that, that you do get a significant proportion of, of athletes who have significant calcium scores. Yeah, and events. And actually, I do have one paper on that very topic. And while it is true that the athletes are a little better off in general, and they seem to calcify in a more more towards density and less volume, as you mentioned earlier. They have a little bit more safety. But when you look at the actual heart attack rates between low and high scoring athletes in the high activity group, they're not that much different than other people. So a high score still means an enormous relative risk. So yeah, the our guys who got the high scores and in the movie we're going to go back and rescan them and there's going to be really interesting data coming out of that. Uh, but one of the guys we rescanned, he said he's lost several friends from the sporting community, wow. dead at, in their forties and fifties. So, so I think yeah. so. The question then is, I suppose it's important to work out what may have caused it in these people, and then what to do about it. Um, it could be stress in certain people, the stress of exercise. You know, um, exercise does cause stress on the body. There are lots of amazing effects on the body, but it could be that it causes a certain stress or the certain amount of exercise in certain susceptible individuals could cause them to have coronary disease. So that's one mechanism. It could be something that, you know, a phrase that I used in an editorial, which became very well known, which I wrote with Tim Noakes and Steve Finney, is that it could be because of the diet. You can't outrun a bad diet. And certainly um, one of the studies that, um, that we cited was looking at the availability of sugar, uh, and, and it's, and it's uh, uh, correlation with the prevalence of type 2 diabetes, independent of weight and activity, um, showed a very increased prevalence of, of, of type 2 diabetes in certain groups in the populations, suggesting a high sugar diet, despite if you, even if you're active or slim, is likely to increase the risk of type 2. So I think that um, it's important if we, if we understand those concepts and the science is there, then that may explain why some of these people are developing coronary disease despite being active and slim. It could well be that they had a high sugar, high carbohydrate diet. I don't know. It could be something else. Yeah, and we'll, uh, exactly as you say, with more use of calcification, not only will the most important thing happen that uh, a recent paper showed that of the foreseeable heart attacks using the risk algorithm or and or the calcium scan, a third of the heart attacks that happened were only predicted by the calcium scan. So if you've got millions of heart attacks out there and tragedies, a third of those could only be seen by a calcium scan, and these are middle-risk people, yeah. so it's huge. But you're right, with more use of the scan, we get to tease out as well more around causes. And our guys, definitely, there's a trend towards very high blood glu- glucose after a meal, even though their fasting's good, their A1C is good, um, their metrics look fine, their ratios look okay. How interesting. Yeah, How so interesting. I, I think the metabolizing lots of sugar and carb intensively. I, I think what would be useful if you've got that sample of patients is to see if there's any correlation with liver fat. I know you're going to be speaking to Robert Lustig soon. And these people that have a so-called carbohydrate intolerance from their glucose monitoring. So if you're able to get MRIs or DEXA scans to look at the visceral fat, it may well be that they are tofi. They are thin on the outside and fat on the inside, that these are slim athletes, but actually they have excess liver fat. Um, I would be particularly interested because um, it would be uh, that would also make sense. What wouldn't make sense and would need further explanation is somebody that has normal metabolic markers, doesn't have any visceral fat, yet their coronary arteries are full of calcium. Now, that would not make sense to me. Yeah, it could be. I guess there could be an intermediate state where there's not a huge amount of liver fat. 
but the dysfunction is established. Uh, but we have we don't really have extensive analysis of these people. But I think if we could start looking at doing trials of this type, we would yeah. basically. But even as an observation, I, I, yeah. I think if you could, if you've got a handful just in those people, it'd just be very useful just to scan them with an MRI and actually see, you know, it's non-invasive, it's safe. It, have they got any liver fat? Uh, especially if they've got, you know, exaggerated glucose responses to, to, to high glycemic index foods. True. And the only challenge is the same that <laughs> we are now post filming. So oh, right. uh, some of these guys that we've rescanned, they've been doing the right thing for six ah, months. Fine. So we, we may have lost. And originally we just did a kind of blood tests. There were some limitations. But interestingly, their liver markers, which I went through, did not were not notable in any way. Sure. Interesting a lot. fatty liver, yeah. But yeah, but yeah, next time maybe. Great yeah, stuff. Yeah, fantastic. And you, are you looking into some kind of trial? I think. Yeah, I think so. I'm. Uh, I've designed a trial, uh, a randomized control trial that we want to make sure is 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 well, it, it for sure has to have no uh, commercial influence. No one's going to profit result from the results other than the public. Um, but really, des designing. I've designed a randomized control trial to actually look at true coronary disease reversal as is possible, and can lifestyle interventions specifically reduce heart outcomes, so as in reduce heart attack, strokes, and death. And I think we've got the science to test that. Um, we have observational data. There has been some other studies done showing this. This is coronary regression or um, uh, reversal of coronary disease is, is certainly plausible but it hasn't been tested in a rigorous randomized control trial, and that's what I've designed. So uh, that's my next bit of work. Excellent. Well, that, that is truly a first. Yeah, there are associational studies. I think William Wheatbelly Davis just looked at his patients and on his treatment regime, which would be quite similar, I think, to what you're probably thinking about, um, they had regression and stabilization relative to the population, but it's not controlled, it's not randomized. Exactly. exactly. But the observation itself is still fascinating. It's, it's not supportive. something that's well known or discussed in cardiology circles at all. It's all based upon medical therapy and reducing event rates. But coronary regression is something that I, in my whole career, you know, and... Uh, I've rarely seen, I mean, it's not something that you'd, you know, routinely necessarily come across, but, um, you know, and what well, I've, I've probably managed, um, well over 10,000, maybe 20,000 patients in my career. So, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, 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 it's fascinating. It's worth investigating. It's the Holy Grail. I think and my genuine like. view mm. is I think that it is plausible and, uh, there is almost certainly, I think that it can be done. But we just need to work out what exactly, uh, you know, to prove that what interventions can do it. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, just a reminder to the audience and upping the ante or holding a hostage to fortune here. The Heinz next door study and many other studies have clearly declared that calcification is inevitable, progressive and can be mathematically modeled for any score or age you are. They've mathematically modeled it will go up X percent per year. That is How interesting. on the record, the medical world. So if you show, you know, it's a paradigm shift, isn't it? It's a paradigm shift. Regression, and it's, huge. it's based yeah. upon also the editorial that you, you remember I wrote in 2017 with Pascal Mai and Rita Redberg about, you know, coronary artery disease is a chronic inflammatory condition linked to insulin resistance. So really the scientific basis behind it, you know, and that can be managed by lifestyle interventions. That is the next stage, which is the RCT. Um, but, you know, it's interesting you say it would be a paradigm shift, but, you know, we, we say the same thing about type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is a chronic irreversible condition that will gra gradually get worse over time. We know that's not true anymore. So let's look at heart disease reversal next. It's a perfect analogy, yeah, uh, absolutely. So game-changing stuff, which is always great to be involved in. So thanks a lot. Thanks, good mate. Always great good to see you. Bye now. Take care. Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my subscribe button in the middle of the screen, a free viewing of the Widowmaker movie on the far right, and myself and Dr. Gerber's book, Eat Rich, Live Long, on the left. Otherwise, please do subscribe to the audio podcast. Thanks.